This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morin. Father, help us to understand from the standpoint of your word why we have a mandate to share the gospel with fellow sinners, to even offend them with the cross, to tell them things they don't want to hear, to subject ourselves to persecution and ridicule, and how they're in pain, we're in pain, we're all in pain, can be very nasty, we can get killed out of this. And yet we have a divine mandate to tell other people that what they believe is wrong and what we believe is right. Father, help us to understand how we can have the audacity to evangelize sinners. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We've already dealt uh, in our introduction with wheeling away the rubbish with many points um, that are erroneous ideas concerning personal evangelism. We now turn to part one, which is the biblical mandate to witness. Now, what do we mean by that? Before we address the how of witnessing, we must first deal with the why of witnessing. Now, you're going to run out and start witnessing or ask for a plan when you have no warrant from God, no mandate. I just debated not too long ago uh, the head of Infidel Guy. Some of you may have seen him on uh, Trading Spouses where... Uh, he was forced to wear a Jesus Saves hat and was reduced to a, a, a blubbering idiot uh, during the show from the Christian woman. So they put him in a Christian home and uh, put the Christian woman over in the atheist. It was an interesting situation. But when I debated him, I said, you make a living by attacking religion. You spend your life ramsacking through the Bible to find contradictions. You are doing your best to destroy the faith of Christians. And if you can convert anybody, you parade them around in a cart and a pony type show. What is your mandate? Why are you bothering? You're going to take an 82-year-old woman who believes she's going to go to heaven and be with Jesus and see her mother, and you're going to do your best to destroy her faith and reduce her to tears? What is your mandate? I mean, the Christians have a mandate. Go into all the world and bug all people. I mean, Christians have a mandate to bug people. But you're an atheist. Where do you get your divine mandate to bug Christians? He had no answer. He has no mandate. And what you must understand, you need to have biblical warrant for what you do. No, a warrant means, like in the court system, if they're going to enter your house and search it, they must have a warrant to do that. You could, if the police came to the front door, May we come in? All you have to say is no. Why? The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you have no right to enter my house without my permission. Or they have to get a warrant issued from a judge to do it. The same thing when it comes to Christianity. You better have a written document that gives you a warrant to do what you're doing. Now, what is the written document to which I refer? Anybody know? The Bible. That gives you the warrant. Now, today we face the situation where people don't have a warrant and they do whatever they want to do. They do whatever they want to do in the name of Christianity. And they, it never it dawns on them to ask for a mandate. Before you engage in an activity... Maybe you ought to sit down and think about if you ought to do it. 
particularly if what you're going to be engaged in is going to split your family, lead to divorce, cause great problems and disruption in society, lead possibly to murder and death, losing your money, your inheritance. In the Soviet Union, they used to put you in a mental ward and shoot you up with sulfur drugs. So if you're going to do something, you better figure out if you ought to do it. Oughtness, mandate. Well, this immediately leads us once again to understand the failure of natural theology. He said, now, Dr. Bob, why are you getting after natural theology? Because I'm writing a book on it. It's on my mind. But here an example. This evening, J.P. Moreland, William Lane Craig, and the other natural theologians who define themselves, I'm quoting them, we are theological rationalists, end quote. They said it, that's how they described themselves. Natural theologians argue human reason, in and of itself, independent of God and special revelation, so independent of and apart from God, the Bible, and Jesus, human reason, experience, and feelings, and faith, man is sufficient in and of himself to be the origin of truth, justice, morals, meaning, and faith. Matter of fact, you can figure it all out just by really thinking very hard about something. You don't need the Bible for morality. You don't need the Bible for theology. You can thunk it. And if you thunk really hard, you can get everything and never crack the Bible. So here we have, for example, philosophic foundations of a Christian worldview, which is, in terms of the number of pages, 653 pages. And if you put a gun to the head of the authors and said, show me any exegesis of Scripture, you just have to shoot them on the spot, they'd be dead. Matter of fact, if you look under the name index of the people they cite whose views are important, not subject, but look under the uh, name index, there's Aristotle, oh my, pages 2, 11, 71, 85, 113, Goes on and on. Plato, oh, look at all, oh, oh, all the heathen. You look under J for Jesus, there's nothing. He's not mentioned. So you have a Christless apologetic, a Bible-less apologetic, and a God-less apologetic. See, we can do it. Just give us until tomorrow. That's how Schaefer mocked them. Just give us until tomorrow and will find truth without God. Now, these people make a living doing apologetics. They're doing it this week. They write books. They teach classes. And yet, you will search in vain, as I have done in all of the books, an answer to a very simple question. By what warrant, where's your mandate on human reason alone for witnessing and for apologetics. Now, you, you're earning a living. Do you ever justify on human reason alone that we should engage in such a nefarious activity? I really want you to use the little gray cells that Hercule Perrault describes. If you quote the Bible to prove that you ought to witness and yet your position is you don't have to quote the Bible, have you just refuted yourself? If your position is that human reason is sufficient for theology, and yet you have to go to the Bible in order to get a mandate for apologetics, have you just shot yourself? Yes, you have violated everything you said. So what I do find is they say nothing. They never discuss the issue, why should we bug other people? The issue at once reveals the utter bankruptcy of natural theology. 
If human reason, experience, feelings, and faith, in other words, rationalism, empiricism, mysticism, and fideism are self-sufficient to be the sole basis and origin of truth, justice, morals, meaning, and beauty, as natural theologians are always claiming, and this whole week will be claiming, then have they been able to justify witnessing and apologetics on the sole basis of human reason, experience, feelings, and faith? On what basis do they feel they have a mandate to witness to unbelievers? They said, boy, we're going to win atheists for... Why? Where's your mandate? You can't go to the Bible now, right? So if I were to bring a rock... Out of that rock you're going to have to give me a mandate for witnessing. Now, you can squeeze that rock. You can become a pet rock, and you can pet it, kiss it, roll it. Is it going to tell you that you have a moral obligation to tell people about Jesus? That's what they claim. Well, have they ever given a naturalistic mandate, a rational basis, they don't. I haven't found a single one of them to do it. You know why? They know better. The moment you ask them, have you demonstrated on the basis of human reason alone, the Latin sola rationae, that you should be running around cramming your ideas down other people's throats, being critical and judging other people's ideas and telling them they're wrong and yours are morally and intellectually superior and you're running around trying to convert. What's your mandate from nature, from human reason alone? Well, they know they'd be a dead duck. They can't answer. They can't face that, you see. Remember the natural theologians are boasting that human reason is sufficient for everything. You said everything? Yeah, the existence of God, the nature of God, the attributes of God, the nature and attributes of man, salvation, even the afterlife, the existence of the soul, all of that is explicable on the basis of rationalism. There is no further need for the Bible. The Bible is, in English, we call redundant. It's redundancy. When you got fired back in old England, they said you are redundant, meaning you're no longer needed. Natural theologians have ne never been able to justify sharing their faith or defending it on the sole basis of human reason. Why? You can't have a humanistic reason for witnessing an apologetics. Each of us have our own personal subjective sense of what is rational or what is common sense or what we ought to do. One man's reason is another man's idiocy. It varies from culture to culture. What is rational to you may not be rational next week. We all know this in our own experience. Now you married her. Yes, I did. You married him. Yes, I did. Was it a rational? It was absolutely rational. Common sense. It looked the best thing we could possibly do. But now what do you say? It was utterly stupid and insane. We made a mistake, Dr. Bob. We need a divorce because we were stupid. Now wait a second. You mean it's no longer rash? Oh, it's a total idiocy to be married. Well, each of us understand that rationality comes and goes as the ebb tide of the ocean. How we feel certainty, there is no absolute certitude on a humanistic basis because certitude 
is a psychological scale that moves up and down. Some mornings we feel more certain, he does love me. The next morning, he doesn't. The bum. We are more certain sometimes and less certain. It comes up and down the scales. Sometimes it's just blood sugar. That's all. Remember counseling one woman, giving her family fits. I looked at her elongated neck like a giraffe. I said, have you had a thyroid test? No, why should I? I said, I think you've got problems. Looked like a giraffe there. She went, she had thyroid problems, she had uh, anemia. They put her on thyroid medicine and I, and she became the sweetest person. And the husband said, you gave me my wife back. Took two pills. <laughs> Created up. Well, you see, on a humanistic basis, if you say, I'm putting the Bible aside, I'm putting God aside, I'm putting Jesus aside, does it make any rational sense to assume that, number one, what you believe is so intellectually and morally superior to everyone else's beliefs? Doesn't that sound like a terribly conceited ass? What you believe, just on a humanistic basis, is so superior to every... You could look down through your nose at the rest of humanity, the poor fools. That, number two, you feel you have the right to interfere with the belief system of other people to invade their space. So I have a right. You're an idiot. I need to help you out. I am superior. You need help. That, number three... You're going to impose your own system of belief on them, forcing them to give up their beliefs and adopt yours. Just on a humanistic basis. When you invade other people's space and you put down their beliefs and you try to push your ideas down their throat, they often feel attacked and uneasy and unloved. They get upset. Why are you interfering with their beliefs and causing them pain and discomfort? Is it not conceit to assume that you have the right to bug other people with your beliefs or to condemn what other people believe? This is why the average Christian doesn't witness. It doesn't make any sense. This is getting down and nasty. We have all been in situations with relatives where we know we should say something, but we don't. Or at work, we ought to have defended Christ. We should have said something. But we didn't. Because it would have caused too much trouble. It would get people upset. We might get fired. We looked and we saw how much trouble and hot water we would get into. Or the misery we would cause. And from a humanistic, purely humanistic basis, it didn't seem rational to invade other people's space and to come in swinging and to demand your way. See, we have to face reality. The average Christian does not witness. Why not? They don't feel there's any mandate because they see no sense to it. All it does is cause trouble. We just want to get along and what? If Yeah, get along. Those who go along, get along. The average Christian does not witness because he has no mandate on per purely humanistic grounds. So having looked at the natural theologians, they won't even touch this issue with the 10-foot pole. On wh Where's their mandate for apologetics? Why are you trying to win an atheist over? On the basis of, of human reason alone, 
Why are you bugging an atheist? If he doesn't want to believe in God, it, that's fine. If you believe in God and it makes you happy, okay. Just don't bug people. Is this not the dominant philosophic view today? Yes. And the church, having married the world, is aping the same. Now, if you say, well, Dr. Bob, you mean on human reason alone, there's no reason to witness or defend? Yeah, because everything is relative. I have my beliefs, you have your beliefs. I had a call today to go on the radio tomorrow night to debate an atheist professor of logic. And I said, well, we need to postpone it because I need to read what he has written. I can't hold a man's feet in the fire if I can't quote what he has written and use it to knock him over the head. So until you email me what this guy has written on atheism, I'm not about to. I'm not going to debate someone blind. How do I know what he says? I got to have my ammunition. I want my bazookas ready. I want the bombs ready. And then I go on and I blow him up. That's the way you got to do it. Well, if someone said, Dr. Bob, if you don't begin with God and you begin with man, you're saying you go nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. You mean there's no meaning, no truth, no justice? Yeah, if you, if you begin with man, you end with nothing. Humanism has been tried for thousands of years. And it never worked for anybody. Plato, Aristotle, I don't care. In the church, out of the church, pagan, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, I don't care. They never got anywhere. How do you know? Because the Bible tells me the world with all its philosophic wisdom never knew God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said they failed. They flapped. Well, then... How come you share your faith with other people? Knowing it's going to cause trouble. Well, I have a divine mandate. It's the same reason I know that Jesus loves me. Now, on the basis of human reason alone, human experience alone, experience and reason and feelings, it doesn't look like Jesus loves me, people. I didn't win the lottery. I didn't win. If Jesus really loved me, I would have won the lottery. If Jesus really loves me, I would be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. And my marriage would be perfect. And I would have perfect kids and a perfect church. And a great salary. Just heard about this group that pays pastors to start a church. And the guy's been given $150,000 two years in a row. And he has 30 people. I said, I'm signing up. I said, I had to give up my salary a month this last year in order to pay the mortgage. I need that 150000 Where do I sign? But what gets me is this. How do I know that Jesus loves me? Can I go to a rock? No. Do I see evidence of the good, the bad, and the ugly in my life? Yes. Now, if you put God to the side, you put Jesus to the side, you put the Bible to the side, on the basis of human experience and reason and feelings, I don't think you can prove to me from a rock or a tree stump that Jesus loves me. I get sick, I have car accidents, we lost all our money in a pre-IPO, for sure, Get rich, screen, uh, get rich Quick scheme with Lee Iacocca. You couldn't believe it. Mr. Midas touched it. And it didn't end up gold. It ended up fool's gold, and I was the fool. Took it all. But how do I know that Jesus loves me? Jesus loves me. This I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. You can't find that with human reason. Look at your life. I'm not the only one here. I've had a hard life. Anybody else here have a hard life? Any of you lose your marriage, lose your job, lose your health? You have kids that are crackheads? There's a lot of things in your life that aren't exactly coming up roses, people. But you know what? The Bible tells me Jesus loves me. 
And he won't allow anything to happen to me that isn't in the end good for me. And all the bad things that happened to Joe, remember Joe? Thrown into a hole, beat up by his brother, sold into slavery, went to prison on a trumped-up rape charge, was forgotten. Poor Joe. How did he know Jesus loved him? Because the Bible said so. And he said, hey, you meant it for evil. Jesus meant it for good. So he saw Jesus loves me. Say, so how do you, why do you want a witness? Because the Bible tells me so. How do you know you should defend the faith? Because the Bible tells me so. The only mandate for witnessing and apologetics is the Bible tells me so. Anything less than that is no mandate. Because I am at that point in the quagmire and in the quicksand of relativism and I would rather go along and get along and go get rich and enjoy life and not bug people about salvation. So that's why pets are marvelous. I, we have this little dog we absolutely love. And my wife keeps bringing up, I'm so happy that we don't have to worry about the salvation of Scotty. You don't have to grieve over the salvation of your dog and be crying, Oh, God, please make Scotty make it to heaven, sore. He's a dog! Then have an immortal soul. See, but why? Because the Bible tells me so. Now, once you understand this, this is really a Copernican revolution. Because when I pick up the humanists, they're religious humanists, secular humanists, these are religious humanists. When they answer how to witness, they say, well, we want to have a rational way. We want a relevant way. They're going to tell you how to witness by a plan that is the product of their reason, experience, feelings, and faith. Do you really want to have a rational? See, I looked at this book. I've been counting how many times the word rational appears. A rational Christianity. We must have a rational theology. We must have a rational world. I think one author, three pages, 21 times, he uses the word rational. Did he say biblical? What's the difference? The difference is wide as the ocean. Someone who says, I want a rational way to defend the faith. I want a rational theology. I want a rational way to witness means I am sufficient in and of myself to develop what to say and how to say it apart from God. As one Dutch theologian beautifully put it, the attempt to find God without God is doomed from the beginning. So I'm not going to give you a rational method. I'm not interested in it. It's pure speculation. One man's reason is another man's idiocy. I'm not interested in experiential, that is, Dealing with existential. Those who trust experience say, oh, I know a way to witness it really works. We really rack up the converts. Yeah, you can rack it up. The Mormons are doing that. The Mormons have a marvelous, marvelous uh, method. Every Mormon teenager after high school spends two years on the mission field at mom and daddy's expense. And the Mormon church is the fastest growing cult in the world. And there are Christians saying, wow, let's do it too. Is there any biblical warrant that every Christian teen must go to the mission field for two years? At mom and daddy's expense? No. But someone who is an existentialist who looks only at experience to say, if it works, that's all that matters. In philosophy, it's called utilitarianism. That's why Rick Warren has announced that he's teaming up with 
Rodney McDonald or Rod, what, who, what is the first? Ronald McDonald. Ah, I had Rodney. Ronald McDonald. So many people kept, you don't know about the class. I said, no, I never paid any attention to him. Rodney Ru- Rudolph or whatever he is. He's that idiot with the, the red thing. And Rick Warren is teaming up with Ronald McDonald, and they're going to put McDonald hamburger franchises in all their churches. Do they have a biblical warrant? Go ye into all the world and build hamburger franchises for McDonald's. I don't think so. Of course, they're saying that Willow Creek is talking to the Burger King people. And the Burger King is scheduled to speak from the pulpit. Because now we have a franchise war. You see, someone would say feelings, mysticism. Oh, I know how to witness. The Lord appeared to me and told me. It came to me in a vision and in a dream. Yes, this is the way thou shalt go. I heard a little voice saying, This is the way you should go. Mystics, empiricists, fideists. This is the way you should witness. Why? Because it's the way. Well, how do you know it's the way? Because I said so. That's all. Now, as I looked at the books dealing with personal evangelism, Shazam Gali. This one is rational. This one is empirical. This one is mystical. Does anybody ever discuss the Bible? And I'm, I'm ransacking books on evangelism. No one ever opened the Bible. What about having a biblical view of witnessing? Shocking! Why would we want to follow Jesus, that old fuddy-duddy? Didn't Alfred North Whitehead said Jesus wasn't all that intelligent? Isn't Jesus ignored by the best of the Christian apologists and theologians because Jesus is our Savior but not our philosopher? So Moreland begins by quoting a Roman Catholic philosopher by the name of Malik who says, every minister of the gospel should spend years reading Plato and Aristotle. No mention of reading the Bible. And they said the most important essential for pastoring is a grasp of Greek philosophy. I would s- submit to myself that that's the wrong with the ministry today. That all they know is humanistic philosophy. They never read the Bible for five minutes. I just looked at this and said, this means I've got to go to work again. This is ridiculous. Why can't I find a book where someone asks very simple questions? If special revelation is the basis of the mandate, we witness because God said to do that. We preach, we evangelize, because God told us, and he said, I will hold you accountable on the day of judgment. You have a moral imperative to spread the word. If you are silent, I will get you on the day of judgment but I'm going to get you in this life called chastisement. I'm going to whoop you behind if you don't do what I tell you. You say, oh, what a horrible God. Yeah, he's a God you have to fear. Any God you don't fear is not the God of the Bible, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the judgment of God must begin with the house of God. So I just simply sat down and says, well, we have a Bible. What's the mandate? Where is it? Well, you begin with the first part of the Bible, which is what? The Old Testament. And I went through the table of contents, meditating on every single book in the Old Testament. Organized religion began with whom? Who was the first organized religionist? 
Come on. They had organized religious services. Seth. In the days of Seth, writes Moses, men began to call upon the name of the Lord and to separate themselves from those who didn't. So organized religion that met separately as the body of believers began with Seth. Now, as they were organized and they went forth into the world, do you find anywhere in the book of Genesis where God told the patriarchs, run over to Pharaoh and tell them God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? So this is where we have inner reaction. Turn to your table of contents. We'll at least get a few books. I want you to put your thinking cap on. The first book of the Torah, Breshit. Breshit bara elchim hashemayim vacharetz. When the beginning began, God created out of nothing hashemayim, the heavens and the earth ha'eretz. Anywhere in Genesis could anybody show me any command in which the patriarchs were told to witness to the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Moabites? Anybody find anything in Genesis? Nothing. Well, see, that's one thing. You say, well, no command in Genesis. Read through the whole book, never found a single command. Well, is there an example of where a believer in Yahweh ran out with great excitement to tell unbelievers, let's say Egyptians during the Exodus, who ran out to tell people all about Jehovah God? Can you give me a specific example of where the Jews evangelized heathen nations for Yahweh. Can anybody give me an example in the book of Genesis? No, not really. But what about precept, where the concept is taught? Anybody? You can come up to the mic. I, I ransacked the book. I didn't find it. No, there's no command. There's no example. There's no precept. Now, through the back door, stretching a little bit, you can say it's part of the cultural mandate to take dominion over the planet. And we are God's servants, prophet, priests, and kings. We're supposed to take over the planet. And part of that would be evangelizing the world because we're supposed to take it over. The trouble is the Jews didn't understand it that way because none of them ran around and did it. So while the Dutch theologians can talk about the cultural mandate as the basis of the missions mandate, the trouble is, I can't find a single Jew who ever understood it that way. So it seems to me that that's a dead end. That's a dead end. Well, what about the book of Exodus? What a wonderful opportunity. Did they run over and evangelize the Egyptians? Any command in Exodus to go and share your faith with Pharaoh? Anybody? What about an example? Well, we can squeak one in maybe, or... We are told that a large amount, a mixed multitude, left with the Jews when they left Egypt. And that is someone who could say, well, evidently the Jews were evangelizing because these people left with them. But the book of Hebrews comments on whether or not they were believers. What does the book of Hebrews tell us about the fate of those who left with Moses? They did not enter into heaven. They died in unbelief. So they left because they were slaves who wanted freedom. They did not leave because they believed in the Lord God and said, Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Do you find example, command, or precept as a divine mandate in Exodus? 
Anybody find it? Well, we looked at Exodus. Levit- what about Leviticus? Command, example, precept in Leviticus? Anybody find anything in there? No, I found a lot of rules, how to cut your hair, what meat to eat. Well, surely in Deuteros Nomos, 40 years have now passed, the new generation getting ready to go into the promised land. You've got numbers, Leviticus numbers, anything in numbers, which is actually the Hebrew word lotteries. So you can buy your lottery ticket, just make sure you tithe to Jesus. We'll take the tithe of the 77 million right here. Lotteries. Anything in numbers, command, precept, example? No. What about deuteros nomos? No. No. Matter of fact, we, got, we can march through the Old Testament. And we're running into a problem. What is the problem we're running into? No command, no example, and no precept because we're dealing with a sacral religion. Remember our lecture on baptism. A sacral religion, you are born into it. You do not convert to it. If you were born a Jew, you belong to that religion. The nation, the state, and the religion were one. You did not enter Old Testament religion by conversion, but it was an automatic part of your citizenship. If you were a Jew, you were supposed to worship Jehovah. If you were a Canaanite, you were supposed to worship Dagon and Moloch and Baal. Sacral religions are not interested in converting other nations. They're only interested in maintaining their own religion, which is part of their own nation, for self-identity. Back in Genesis, how would uh, Abraham have taken in uh, Genesis 22, 18, that through thy seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed? Are your question, how would Abraham have understood the prophecy? Forth in any way or take the message of God's word to the nations, or was that just, what was his understanding of that? His understanding is that his physical descendants would make a lot of money and would prove to be a blessing to the rest of the planet, but there's nothing in there about evangelizing the heathen. Matter Matter of fact, we see Lot was miserable. He didn't do too good a job at Sodom. He even lost his kids to the Sodomites. So it was abysmal failure. There's nothing there that you can really find for witnessing. Okay, but do we use that today in mentioning the Messiah, that through the Messiah the nations will be blessed, the seed? seed well, again, one, see, what, what you're doing, you okay. can't read from the okay. New Testament back into the Old. Okay. We're moving through the Old Testament asking, right. at this okay. time period, are we finding a command? No, it's a sacral religion. Okay. It was a, a, a state church. You were born into it. It was part of your citizenship. It was automatic. There was no need to be born again, saved, or forgiven. That was just your religion. That's what you're born into. A sacral religion, that's all. Thus, the idea of evangelization is missing entirely. Right. Simply not there. Thank you. All right. Well, the Pentateuch, and we'll close here, Deuteronomy, you ain't going to find it. Zip. You have to come up to the mic. Dr. Mori, what about Ruth? She was a Moabite. That's not the book, of, uh, it's not in the uh, Pentateuch, is it? No, it's not. All right, when we get to Ruth, we'll talk about there are a few examples of Gentiles who became Jews, who joined the nation. Your people become my people. Your God becomes my God. They assimilated to the nation. The idea of personal conversion doesn't even necessarily rate very high. It was more of assimilation to a nation, a culture, a sacral religion. So next week we'll begin picking up with the Old Testament. When we get to the Psalms, I will tell you there's a little bit of hope. There is a little bit. I've ransacked the Old Testament like Filene's basement, Macy's basement. 
ramsacking it for command, example, and precept. Because I want to be biblical. I just can't find any book that does it. Any of you know a book that does it? It would be interesting to find one. If you know, let me know, because I haven't found it yet. It's uh, when we, uh, we will later deal with the minor prophets, and we'll even deal with Jonah's mission to condemn, not to evangelize. <laughs> and how depressed he got and deeply surprised when there was repentance and he didn't want it. He didn't need it. He wanted to see those uncircumcised dogs die. So no, he was not an evangelist, as we shall see. Father, we do thank you that you have given us your word, and it helps us to get level-headed and understand. We thank you that when we come to the New Testament and the New Covenant, which is no longer a sacral religion, but New Covenant religion is to penetrate all nations, all cultures, and you enter the New Covenant by regeneration, not by generation, by the new birth, not just the old birth. And Father, we pray that you will inform us and equip us to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. You have come to the end of this lecture. To continue with the series, please listen to the next lecture.